So welcome back everyone. Uh, my name is Carol St. Hilaire. I'm the board chair of My Dog is My Home. I'm also the executive director of the Waterfront Project, a legal center that provides legal representation, housing assistance, and advocacy to New Jersey residents who are at asset limited, income constrained, homeless, or disenfranchised. I'm also your moderator for the session. You have joined the workshop writing the emotional support animal letter. This will be an interactive workshop on whether and how to write ESA verification letters using specific case examples, which Janet's going to share. Um, and I'm really so excited for you guys um, to get to hear from Janet. Um, Dr. Janet Hoy Gerlach, I'm sorry if I butchered that. Um, is a social worker, educator, and researcher seeking to improve the well-being of people and non-human animals through recognition and support of the human-animal bond in health, mental health, and uh, human services. Toward that end, she founded One Health People Animal Wellness, OPAWS, to assist in developing services that mutually support human and animal well-being. She authored Human-Animal Interaction, a social work guide, along with her colleague, Scott Weeman. This book was published by NASW Press in 2017. Uh, Janet presents and trains internationally on therapeutic animal roles and health and mental health benefits of human-animal interaction. She has served as an expert witness on emotional support animals for the U.S. Department of Justice Civil Rights Division and recently completed a study detailing the benefits of ESAs that can be accessed for free. The article has been made available right here uh, on the app. So yep. thank you so much for joining us, Janet. I want to give you all the time in the world. I'm so excited. Thank you, Carol, for uh, that introduction and for, for helping to, to moderate as, as we meet today. So my goal of, you know, for, for me, as I'm, I'm sharing with you, is, is that the information I provide um, it's going to have each of you feeling more comfortable and confident about um, working with situations around emotional support animal letters. So, so a bit of this is going to be some review again. Um, you know, there's there's much more we could talk about, but I want to keep this straightforward and immediately usable. So we're going to talk, kind of go back over the basic knowledge to help you be confident and, and comfortable approaching, you know, emotional support letter animal issues. And then we're going to walk through some case examples. Um, they are actual cases that are, are of course, details disguised and are, I, I feel, um, not representative, each case is unique, but but at least some of the common issues that over the years I've, I've seen recur that I thought might be helpful to, to look at. So this is um, a memo that was put out by HUD. It is in the information that is available on the app. Uh, I, I highly encourage you to, to take a look at it. It's about 20 pages. It's called Assessing a person's request to have an animal as a reasonable accommodation under the Fair Housing Act. This is um, the most recent guidance from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD. It came out in 2020, uh, and this, this is uh, the, the information that uh, really provides the parameters in the United States for uh, emotional support animal verification and accommodation. And I want to point out, um, you know, you see this is an actual screenshot of the memo. And down here where it says purpose, um, you see animals that individuals with disabilities may request as a, a reasonable accommodation, two types. So I want to point out that it, under the Fair Housing Act, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD, they use the term assistance animals to include service animals. So these are animals that are task trained. They are taught specific things to do to help somebody with aspects of their disability, the most common being the guide dog. Um, but there are animals that help with mobility, animals that are trained to do things to help with mental health, with, with hearing impairment, all sorts. The thing is they're trained or taught. Um, 
The second type that they have here under assistance is trained or untrained. And then they have sort of a, a number of things and therapeutic emotional support for individuals. And they use the term support animal. Um, everyday language, emotional support animal seems to have stuck. So that's, that's the term that, that I use. So this is HUD. Okay, this is one department. I, I just want to point this out because there are um, in practice out in you know the country and, and internationally, folks will often use the term assistance animals to refer to animals that have task training to help with disabilities. So it gets confusing. Um, this assistance animal term is a legal umbrella term. It's, it's specifically used by HUD. Okay, and it includes both types of animals here. So if, if you see it outside of HUD and fair housing context, it may mean something else. So housing is important because housing is really the only space that emotional support animals are um, recognized legally as an accommodation in the United States. And again, this um, unless I point out otherwise, most of this, um, Context information is from that HUD memo. And I just have highlighted here housing or dwelling, um, apartment, condo, co-op, single family homes, nursing homes, assisted living, group home, DV shelter, emergency, homeless shelter, dorms, quite a few. So uh, there's, I, I know a lot of um, misunderstanding. I think, I think the, the knowledge that um, task trained service animals are required to, you know, to be uh, permitted as accommodations and shelters is fairly well known. I don't know that that's the case in uh, the uh, emotional support animal um, responses. And then the definition of disability is here. We'll talk more about that, but um, disability under FHA, this is the federal policy in the United States, Fair Housing Act that recognizes emotional support animals. So we use this definition. And it's broad, um, physical or mental impairment substantially limits one or more life activities. So let's hold that. Here is the three-part definition. What is an ESA? Again, we look to the Fair Housing Act in the United States because that's where um, this, this legal recognition is located and it's an animal that essentially provides that therapeutic emotional support, which has a positive impact on their health or mental health and hence is needed. Um, the person must have a condition, physical or mental, that meets that disability definition under fair housing. And again, the animal must alleviate or be expected to alleviate the distress or impairment related to their condition. So three parts, who is eligible for an ESA? So two things are, are required to be able to be uh, essentially eligible to, to have the animal as an accommodation for housing under the fair housing. One, they have to have that condition, that dis disability, physical or mental health condition that meets Fair Housing Act's definition of, of disability, not others, there's all sorts. So we, we keep it very specific. Um, and then secondly, so these are, are essentially yes or no questions. Do they have the condition that meets the FHA definition? And will having the animal be, um, do, does it or will it be expected to help alleviate impairment related to that person's condition? Those are the two questions. Legally, and again, I'm not a lawyer. Um, I, I work closely with some animal accommodation laws, and um, I'm a, a clinical social worker with a lot of experience at the, the practice end of this. Um, so the first question, do they have a health or mental health condition that meets the definition of disability? Defi definition of disability under FHA, physical or mental impairment, that impairs one or more life activities. From that memo, these are some of them. Walking, speaking, hearing, seeing, breathing, working, learning, performing manual tasks, caring for oneself. Um, and that, that under that are a whole slew of, 
of things that can be impaired by conditions um, related to trauma, to anxiety, to uh, depression or other kinds of mood conditions. And here's some additional life activities that in particular mental health, but also physical health conditions can affect or, or interfere with. Again, sleeping, but I have that, no, sleeping they didn't have, but eating, thinking, concentrating, interacting with others, um, being able to work. And again, not, not working is not a requirement. It be, may be that their condition is uh, affecting their work, the ability to decision make, their, their judgment, their impulse control and self-regulation, problem solving, their ability to have, have insight. And again, the judgment, um, cognitive effects of health and mental health symptoms. So all of these are our life activities. So what constitutes reliable verification of a disability? This, this is what's required um, in order for uh, a person to, to have an accommodation if the, the housing provider is asking for such. They, they can ask for reliable verification. They don't have to. Uh, I want to be clear, if the animal is functioning as an emotional support animal, you know, helping to alleviate a person's, um, you know, symptoms, reduce their anxiety, and they have a, a known anxiety disorder, the housing provider is not required to uh, obtain reliable verification. However, they may. And here are some examples. A, a disability determination from an agency um, eligibility for other kinds of services, information confirming disability from a healthcare professional. So this this may be you know records or a referral to your shelter from a physician or a social worker, or a psychiatrist, um, you know, indicating that mental health condition. And I want to point out just because somebody might not meet criteria for like um, social security or workers comp, that doesn't mean that that person uh, is not meeting the criteria for disability under the Fair Housing Act, okay? Because Social Security is a different policy. It's about income uh, and, and, and income safety net for people. And workers' comp is an income safety net. So those are, are different policies with different definitions that require a much a more high threshold of disability because they're looking at people that, that may not be able to work and then helping to support them with, with income. So a bit more about disability under the FHA. And this was in that 2020 memo. Um, some types of impairments will in virtually all cases be found to uh, impose substantial limitations or impairments on major life activities that result in a determination of disability for the purposes of fair housing. They have listed a number of conditions. Just because the condition's not listed here doesn't mean it's not included. However, I wanna point out major depressive disorder, bipolar disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, traumatic brain injury, obsessive compulsive disorder, schizoaffective, or I'm sorry, schizophrenia. These are all mental health diagnoses. If you have a reliable record and you are, you know, in a, a role at a, a shelter, maybe not a clinical treatment role, but you have that information that you use in your, you know, professional judgments, um, you know, you, you essentially have that disability determination information that you can include in your judgment. There was the question about documentation from the internet. Again, this is page 11 of that memo and HUD differentiates those for-profit websites that sell certificates, registrations, licensing. There are no official registries licensing um, certifications for emotional support animals. The, the documentation that uh, can be requested by a housing provider uh, is, is typically, you know, that, that letter from a healthcare provider or a reliable other third party. Um, the 
housing provider may specifically request health care provider documentation at their discretion. And you can see here it's not listed as the reliable form. It's oops, listed as one reliable form of documentation is a note from their health care provider. That's not a typo. <laughs> they, they have this here. You know, that's that's one form of documentation. So question two, how do we answer that? How does having an emotional support animal help somebody that has a, a FHA qualifying condition like some of them we've looked at? Well, first of all, emotional support animals in terms of how um, the things they do on a daily basis, how they function, um, they're not necessarily distinguishable from what we would call pets or companion animals. There's no special training required for animals to function as ESAs. How come? Okay, because it is the animal companionship and the benefits associated with that. Um, so the everyday interactions that, that you have with that animal that bond that you develop with an animal, those things are associated through an emerging body of, of peer-reviewed research with physical benefits, social benefits, psychological benefits, and emotional benefits um, to people. And while those can be helpful to, to anybody who's receptive and enjoys you know, interacting with animals or is open to that, for people that have physical and mental health conditions, um, these, these benefits can help offset the negative impact of their, their symptoms and, and help alleviate that impairment. We're gonna have a couple examples of that. Uh, actually, we have three cases. A little more on who can reliably verify need for an ESA as an accommodation. Again, if the animal is needed to help alleviate aspects of the person's health or mental health condition as, as meeting you know, disability under the FHA, um, that animal is, is functioning as an ESA. I'll say it again. If the animal is helping to reduce distress or impairment related to a person's health or mental health condition slash disability under FHA, that animal is functioning as an ESA, who can reliably verify that? Um, health or housing provider, so the shelter, the apartment, the condo association, they may request documentation specifically from a health or mental health care provider to verify. Um, they may not require the provider to use their form to provide notarized statements. This is straight from the HUD memo. Um, to make statements under penalty of perjury or to provide the person's diagnosis or any detailed information. So the person, the housing provider may ask for that, but they, they are not legally under the, the HUD memo um, permitted to require that. Tenants may not need to verify um, for accommodation if the disability is obvious or already known to their housing provider. So, for example, um, at least the disability part, I know many times with shelters working with folks with, with mental health concerns, they, they may be somebody that the shelter is familiar with. Um, or that that has a history of them them you know having used the service or support before for help and and has documentation already of that person's condition and we've looked at what qualifies under FHA if it qualifies check like that's question number one met we don't need a whole you know separate review of do they or don't they have it if you already have this information. Uh, you you have it, and if it's reliable and valid for your you know organization's functioning purposes, then um, you, you don't need a separate you know healthcare. You can choose to ask for one, um, or your organization could, but you don't have to have one. Um, 
many providers will request and want specifically a care provider, um, reliable third party may also be acceptable. And this is from the, the Fair Housing Center and their review of HUD um, and other accommodation information. You see a whole range of folks, even with, with family members or coworkers. And while those could constitute reliable verifiers, I, I can say it, uh, uh, probably more likely that there's going to be pushback. So this is an example letter from the, the Fair Housing Center, specifically that's not just aimed at the clinicians, but also reliable third parties, um, you know, to whom it may concern. So you're often giving this to your, your client or filing it in your, your shelter. You don't have to have a specific person. If you give it to the, the individual making the request, they have, you know, a copy of that, but I always, you know, recommend and urge people to keep their own copy as well as, as document, you know, their rationale with it. So I am writing as a, you know, social worker, a, um, a nurse, a uh, shelter coordinator in a position to know about person's name, um, disability, they have a disability as defined by FHA, um, you can use pronoun or you can repeat their name. Um, they require, you know, to have the animal, for example. It affects their ability to, um, you know, it could be, you know, emotional regulation, interpersonal relationships. Um, it, it could be any of like the, a lot of those things that were in red in the, the previous slide away back, think about where is, how is the person struggling as a result of their condition and how is the animal helping through those physical, emotional, social, and psychological benefits? If indeed the animal is helping, often they are, um, but that's, that's where you want to crosswalk that. The animal is needed to help. So here is the first case example. And at this point, I'd, I'd like for us to, to open this up to, to discussion. Um, and again, Carol, if you, you could help me um, so that we can maximize folks' participation. Um, I guess we could just do like a hand raise. And then Carol, if you could suggest that we have people speak. So I actually have been tracking the questions. Um, so we have a few. Um, okay, let's uh, pause and do some questions. One I feel like my uh, go with Kate's example one. Lots Perfect. of question. At my organization, I manage our emergency boarding program for pets of people experiencing some sort of temporary crisis and needing a safe place for their pets. We require the person to have their own case manager helping them stabilize their situation while I am essentially the pet's care manager. Could I... Um, plus or minus working with the human social worker, write an ESA letter for that pet. So it's more, seems like the more the animal welfare interacting with the human uh, services and like trying to coordinate that. Okay, so that, that actually, if um, we took that one step at a time. So the program is a emergency boarding program for animals of people that that have have need for for temporary care. Um, the person has a mental health case manager, so that means that they have ongoing mental health issues. I, I can tell you if you qualify for mental health case management on an ongoing basis, that typically indicates that you have had it not just an isolated. I don't want to say just because isolated incident can be very difficult too. But you know, what it means yeah. is you have an ongoing history of a condition that is, is chronic and, and likely um, affecting your, your abilities to function. Um, so case manager and the question, can I write a letter? So the, the requirements are, can you, you know, reliably verify that the person has a condition that meets that? health or mental health um, 
FHA definition, if you have on your referral form, you know, that I don't know that they're going to give you a diagnosis, uh, but if, you know, the person is in a program for people with serious chronic mental illness and you have a referral form stating that, um, I, I think it could be argued that that is reliable verification. And Carol, feel free to jump in from the link because I'm, you know, I'm a clinician and I have a lot of, of you know, experience training and sort of navigating when people hit barriers. Uh, however, you know, that that is a professional relationship that your shelter has with that treatment agency. You have official treatment documentation saying, you know, they're a client of this. The second, you know, does the animal help the person with the aspects of, of their condition? That um, would be, I don't know if you would have a release where you could have a, a conversation with the case manager, you know, that that's second uh, person information. But again, is it reliable? I mean, you're not you're, you're a professional, you're an animal welfare professional, you're providing a professional service. Is, is your professional interaction with a case manager, is that reliable and valid? You know, that I, I think it argument is thing, imposed. One of the things I hear from like the social services, uh, homeless services field sometimes, and people that aren't animal lovers like you and I, um, is, well, if they can't take care of themselves, how are they going to take care of the animals? And I think in the example, and for the person who wrote this out, if you want to unmute yourself, raise your hand or something to clarify more. Um, this person, the way I understood the question too, was to say like, hey, this person has an ESA letter and I'm this the pet's case worker, sort of like this person can take care of the animal and it's okay. Because I think that that's one of the scapegoats used often by saying, oh, if a person has behavioral health challenges or X, Y, and Z disabilities, they can't possibly take care of an animal. And I do like uh, that approach of like, no, here's a letter from the vet saying this person loves Fluffy and takes really good care of Fluffy and they belong together. Um, so I, I do think that that would be, that's a nice addition. Again, I feel like I wrote in the chat, I feel like we've been gaslit by housing for so long because again, I've been in this work for a really long time and I'm like, oh, we everyone's been doing it wrong. Yeah. And I think that would be the strongest letter. If you could have a conversation with the case manager from the mental health program, they write their letter that the person, you know, has the animal, if they, they feel the animal is helping to mitigate symptoms and then the animal professional side, you know, just additionally adding that the animal, if the animal's in good, you know, condition, generally cared for, you know, not concerns. I don't, that's not legally required, but in terms of helping to reduce barriers and stress in the sort of lived experience realm, like having sort of a, a I know there's a, a One Health clinic in Washington that I believe has an integrated ESA letter where they have like the vet and the the human health care. The vet basically says, you know, they, they examine the animal and the animal looks okay and cared for. And then the the ESA part. So uh, I, ideally, it, it would be engaging the, the case manager around the letter. Um, and again, a reliable third party under that standard, a letter standard, could potentially be written, but I think the potential for pushback from the housing provider would be higher because they can, you know, re request a health healthcare provider as verification if, if they choose to. So that would just add another step for, for the person. Great question. Um, another question that came up, um, how would you approach an agency that is fearful of liability and will not allow their therapists to write ESA letters? Yeah, that that is more common than I, I um, would like to say is reality. And that is you know, what I is the perceived liability though? Um, for those of us are, that have encountered this, yeah. So, um, you know, like I can think of a couple agencies right, right here, you know, where I'm at that with leadership change, um, there's, there's fear that the animal is going to bite the person, 
or uh, somebody else or harm the property or, or basically do anything that could result or the housing provider just refuses the accommodation and a lawsuit happens and the, the agency becomes in, embroiled in a lawsuit. And that's, that's the big fear. I mean, the, the single best approach I think is, is information. If, if they are receptive to basic training, I think once, I mean, a big part is staying in your lane. We actually, like when I talk about emotional support animal letter writing, you'll notice I don't have anything here about me or any of you, unless if some of you are animal care people, in which case that's different completely. However, but like from, from um, you know, like a healthcare provider for humans, you know, we're not verifying the, the specific animal. We're not saying, you know, this, this animal has the perfect temperament and will be, you know, perfectly behaved. What we're saying is, you know, I mean, the animal may be, you know, have, have reactivity and have some issues. However, that same animal may be what's helping to keep somebody alive who has chronic suicidal ideation. And so that animal is absolutely functioning as an emotional support animal. And those are the kinds of things I talk through if I'm able to, to meet, I've met with, you know, private practices of therapists, I've met with, you know, a psychiatry residency program, primary care doctor clinics, you know, and the, the fears are, are, you know, around the animal. Um, that's pretty easy. Don't write an opinion about the animal, <laughs> like stay in your lane. If you have concerns, there's all sorts, like in this group right here, awesome animal people, I, you know, have a, a very close working relationship with our, our humane society here. They help people pick out animals for ESAs. We have a, a good relationship with uh, a local vet clinic if there's help that's needed. So some of it is just helping them rec understand what the parameters are. You know, they're already diagnosed major depressive disorder and post-traumatic. So, you know, that's totally their wheelhouse. Can they talk about what helps somebody's symptoms go down? Absolutely. That's ongoing mental health treatment. Do they know what the benefits of human-animal interaction are? Um, that's not rocket science. I actually, as a professor, like I'm next to the rocket science people and they have a planetarium and all sorts of complex things. Um, you know, somebody not um, taking their own life because of their animal, that's very straightforward. And at least, you know, there's, of course, complexities to it, but you know, there's there's um, definite parameters, and it, it seems once they have the information, they they tend to be more receptive. So, um, primary care practices. Again, this is a generalization, and you know we can get in trouble. But I've found medical doctors to be more um, risk tolerant. I think maybe because they they prescribe medicines and just they're not as nervous about, oh no, if I write a letter, like all these horrible things will, and I, I understand caution. So I don't, I want to, you know, be, be careful to not, you know, sometimes you hear my own frustration going through. I, I, I do appreciate people, you know, wanting to be cautious and careful. However, there's, there's a real need here and there's real benefits that, that people get through their relationships with their animals and vice versa. You know, the animal having that consistent person to, you know, to, together, it's both sides, but typically it's the human side we're working with. So hopefully that's helpful, helping that, you know, offering them educate, you give them my information. Um, I have a emotional support animal 101 training that um, I have free online. It's two hours. Um, I'm, I'm willing to talk with folks if that's helpful. So it's, it's, I feel yeah. like your inbox is going to be very busy after this conference because I already have a bunch yeah, of questions. Yeah. For you. It's, I, I think it's just helping people because I think people do want to do right by their patients and clients. They also want to, you know, not get out of their scope of practice or do something illegal. And I think there's just so much misinformation um, that we, we have some work ahead of us. <laughs> but yes, this is a great definitely. step right here, just being together. 
So how do you truly define misuse of these letters? In my experience, colleagues look for reasons to not write them, which I feel further stigmatizes mental health and invisible disabilities further. Is there a way to make it more black and white? So essentially, the, the misuse, there's there's two sorts of, of um, subgroups there. I think one is, is a, a sort of sincere misunderstanding. Um, you know, folks, those of us that have bonds with our animals and strong attachments, like the, the more places we can, you know, take them with us, the better. And so folks, you know, may, may see having an ESA as a way to go in public with the animal which actually is not accurate. Those are only task trained service animals. So um, there, there's misinformation with that. Then there's folks that, that are um, wanting to pay less for, for rent and deposit and perhaps you know, have, have the means in, in as much as you know, average people can have the means being like a couple paychecks away from <laughs> financial you know, major issues, which are the vast majority of folks, I believe, I haven't looked at the data um, immediately recently, uh, but, you know, so there's sort of this motivation to, to pay less, but, you know, the person may, I have a case example where, you know, they, they may say, no, I'm like, general, my health is okay, like, but the animal's my family member. And that is under the FHA, not a qualifying condition. And believe me, I, I that's a I think that animals as family, like that's a whole other kind of discrimination and we need to, to do things to address that. But if they're saying like, no, I don't have a health issue. The animal's not helping me with my health. They're my family. Like they need to be with me because they're my family under FHA currently. Like that, that's not the definition. Semantics. Of yes. Yeah. So that's, <laughs> that's where, you know, it, it could be misrepresented if somebody then goes on the internet and pays for a letter and then they're like, hey, I have one, so I don't have to pay fees. But in my experience, you know, mental health um, issues have increased, um, you know, post COVID, there's increases in anxiety and depression, um, there's stress related issues, the animals help to mitigate that. So, so a lot of times, you know, there may be an undiagnosed issue where helping the person, you know, get linked for that and then have that and then be able to, to connect the animal benefits and write a letter. That's that's not fraud. That is meeting the, the criteria of um, the policy, which is to help people get what they need to be able to, to use the, the housing. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? I know I see you all interacting with each other on the chat. If not, we can go on to some of the case examples. Okay. So case example one, Jenny Jones seeking access to a human shelter, mixed breed dog, pumpkin. Um, this was a case of uh, the person we're calling her Jenny was well known to the shelter staff. She'd been referred by multiple mental health agencies. Um, this is a human um, housing shelter. And uh, often, you know, would come for a day or so, but um, did not take medications as prescribed for, for any length of time. Um, also had hospitalizations where hospitals would refer her um, and they, they had referral documentation of this, of her, her mental health diagnosis. So, so let's say, um, you know, she's diagnosed with uh, bi bipolar disorder. And Jenny told shelter staff that a friend had given her pumpkin. And so she stops by the shelter worried because pumpkin has a lump, pumpkin seems to be in pain. Um, Jenny's not able or willing to, to identify a specific place she's staying. Um, she's, she's known to be seen on the, the streets, sometimes panhandling or, you know, otherwise trying to, um, you know, get, get resources. But she wanted help for Pumpkin, wants to know if her and Pumpkin can stay at the shelter. So 
two questions. First question, do you all think that Jenny qualifies for an ESA letter? Why or why not? Anybody? Monitoring the chat. Okay, what do we got? You can just put it in the chat and Carol will read it. Is that good? If, I mean, if someone wants to also unmute themselves, I'm refreshing the chat not without having an explanation of how the animal helps her symptoms. Good. Other thoughts? Yes. So let's look back at Sounds this. Like she is already displaying signs of disabilities. Yes, yeah, we have a history here. The shelter staff are not treating healthcare providers. However, they have reliable, valid information in their professional scope of a significant, you know, met, met, and, and even some of this would work, but she, and then she's, you know, this, this is again a composite. Um, unfortunately, this, this isn't that unusual. Um, she does not have a healthcare provider. So there's nobody that in particular she, you know, that where the staff could reach out to and ask for a letter. Um, let's add, we know she has paranoia because that's in the documentation and that uh, is a barrier to her following up for services and taking medications. And the shelter staff knows that, that she's fearful of the shelter staff and she's fearful of medication, but she's now asking for help because Pumpkin needs help. What do you think about that? Well, let me ask this. Would you call paranoia a symptom of a mental illness? Someone said, uh, that's a barrier to being able to stay in one place. Um, I think yes, but would need more information on how pumpkin helps. And then everyone to your last question is saying yes. Okay. So, and if, especially if we have documentation that she, let's say she has bipolar disorder, but there's psychotic features and she's often having mood episodes. And with that is paranoia. So we know this, we know the paranoia has been a barrier to her getting the services she needs to, to help um, take care of her, her health and, and mental health. And her attachment to pumpkin has enabled her to push through the paranoia to ask to stay at the shelter. Is pumpkin helping with symptoms of her mental illness? Uh, one person said, I would say that even though she is not stating that the dog is helping, the shelter staff can see the help. There you go. Her behavior. And I would argue this is you know, probably some of the most vulnerable folks who have the most urgent need for housing accommodation. Literally, they need like the most basic definition of housing, which is shelter and protection from the element. And folks you know, may have the most difficulty from their conditions to the point that that you know they're they're out um not having ongoing safe place to stay and if that animal that bond and the companionship with the animal is is enabling them however it is to help um, take care of themselves. If we think of, you know, taking care of yourself as an activity of daily living, you know, she's, she's on the, the street. Um, certainly, the, you know, some folks may, may, you know, want to live a nomadic existence and, and, you know, sort of have an alternative view on housing. And that that's very different than, than somebody who has chronic impairment of their judgment and their ability, you know, safety choices because they have ongoing psychotic and, and manic symptoms. So we have Pumpkin here who has Jenny able to ask to stay at the shelter if Pumpkin comes with. And um, I'm sure next step would be Pumpkin needs help for her lung. So we have documentation of the disability question one check. 
We have observation of Jenny's behavior, showing us that that pumpkin is mitigating her paranoia, which is it interferes with her ability to care for herself and, and meet her needs. Um, so she would qualify for a letter and a, a shelter staff with that information could serve as a reliable third party and write the letter. Now the shelter an entity could ask for a healthcare provider. However, they would be meeting, you know, I mean, they, that's also under, you know, HUD is, you know, reliable verification includes a reliable third party. So one option would be that a shelter staff based on information could write the letter and then have them come in um, with Pumpkin being an ESA and hopefully link to some accessible veterinary care partner or maybe develop that. Okay, next example. Jack Smith adapted, adopted his cat Fluffy three years ago from Humane Society X. Jack calls Humane Society X and said he needs to move into a new apartment, can't afford the pet deposit fee and monthly rental fee with just his income, says he has to move from his current housing because he's going through a divorce, states Fluffy is his family, I would be lost without her. He says he doesn't currently have a health care or mental health care provider because I'm pretty healthy, I, I don't really need one. Does he qualify for an ESA letter? What do you think? I have someone saying no. Um, Anybody want to say why not? If that's not if with this, not no, not with this info, not yet. Okay. Sorry, my bunny decided to make an appearance. I as see well. cute little bunny ears there. Yeah, so I heard not he yet. Needs, yes, he would need to be evaluated. Okay. So how could the human, should be humane society, I guess, um, how can the humane society staff proceed to help? So that is, I, I would agree with that. With this information, um, you know, we, we don't have any history or current condition. However, he's saying I would be lost without her, um, you know, from a prevention standpoint, that's, that's significant. Um, it, it would be, if he was willing, it would be worth, you know, linking him to a health care provider. Um, he's going through a very stressful life situation. Um, loss can be traumatic. Divorce can absolutely be traumatic. Um, uh, uh, if, if that is happening and Fluffy is helping to mitigate aspects of that that are interfering with his ability, he may be eligible for a letter that would then eliminate those things. So yeah, people are saying I see similar situations like that a lot. Um, yeah, telling them hard. that he would be lost without her. The um, the the humane society can should help provide a referral to the local community health center or something. She so can get support confirmation um, on needing an ESA. Um, and same thing. Um, sort of him saying he would be lost without her. Um, shows like sort of what it would mean if he lost her uh, could count as a traumatic event um, and, and trigger something that might be underlying or that he himself does not um, acknowledge uh, yet. Yeah. So again, this is well, a very cool, <laughs> great, great responses in chat. And I don't have mine up at the moment because again, the walking and chewing gum thing. So, but thank you. I mean, that's, that's exactly, yeah. We, we have a, some risk factor you know, at least he's going through big losses. Are those conditions that fall under FHA? No, but we don't know. I mean, we, we, we you know, ideally we could get more information, very one healthy, you know, hopefully we can help this cat, Fluffy, we can help Jack, um, but, but reaching out to the human provider and, and hopefully it's not, you know, he can stay where he's at for a little bit, but we don't know that, so. Um, great responses, and I'm mindful of time here. I want to leave it more time we'll for questions. Have again. nine minutes before. Okay, we have to one more. So this is case example three. Elijah Hernandez is a veteran and wants to adopt a dog as an ESA. 
Um, he comes to Animal Shelter X and asks for help getting an ESA. He says he's under the care of a mental health provider and his previous dog had helped a lot with his PTSD. Um, he said his previous dog had died a couple years ago. He's been struggling, but was not ready for another dog. Um, he said where he lives now does not allow dogs, so he needs to get an ESA letter first. Does Elijah qualify for an ESA letter? Yes, he does, is what we're getting in the okay. 100%. I mean, PTSD is a diagnosis. Yeah, yeah. And it's in that HUD memo even is one that we don't even need. So um, why or why not? You just said. And then, okay, that one part, that's question one. Does he have the condition that meets FHA disability? Now, he doesn't have a dog right now. So why, why do we think he qualifies as an ES for ESA? He gave us uh, information he reported to us. Prior diagnosis of PTSD. Yes, history of mental health concerns. Yeah. And he history reported, he helping him. there you go. Yeah, that is a big indicator. You know, so we don't have to have an animal. The person does not have to have an animal to get an ESA letter. And I'm asked, well, so how do we even know the animal is going to help? Well, we rely on history, you know, the person's retrospective, do they have a history of the animal helping or a history of positive responses to other people's animals and, and you know, significant relief or comfort that, and then the, the, the literature, um, you know, the, if we have knowledge of those benefits, the physical, the emotional, the social, the psychological that are generally associated with animals that are, would be expected to help um, offset the symptoms. So for, for both of them, but he's, he's got the strongest, which is his last companion. Um, he's flat out said helped him a lot and he's been struggling without, but grief, you know, every, there's no timeline with that. It's all, you know, individual and he needed time, but now he's ready. Um, so what could the shelter do to help him? Um, let me see. Shelter staff can write the letter backing his history of need. So shelter staff could initiate a letter writing process. I would say the, because we're, we're being reported to Let's say I'm a shelter staff. Elijah's reported to me that he has PTSD. I have no reason to disbelieve him. Um, I don't know that that would stand up as like a, a real, I don't have additional verification of that. However, he said he's under the care of a mental health provider. Um, so, so doing a little case managing, not that we have extra time in our lives, but by coaching him, we could provide him with a sample letter, um, explain that, you know, we could even offer, you know, uh, a, a, you know, sample statement, you know, he's met with the animal adoption counselor and is taking, you know, appropriate steps to adopt and, you know, let us know what questions you have. We're happy to, you know, help facilitate an adoption. Um, and then, Again, uh, the mental health, pro health provider would be the, the strongest. Now, the example question at the beginning with the person that had a program is a little different. If you have referrals from that provider, you know, stating Elijah is, you know, our client and um, needs temporary shelter assistance while he's becoming psychiatrically stable or getting his health needs met, um, you know, that, that would be a bit different. That would be, you know, information you have, you know, from your professional role that, that is, uh, you know, formal statement that he has these conditions or condition and, and his report that the animal helps, you could presumably, you know, verify as a reliable third party documenting your sources. Again, you could be accused of hearsay. It could be pushed back. <laughs> um, 
However, your housing provider may take it. They don't have to ask for a health care provider. Nicely done. These are three different but common scenarios. What other questions do we have? So one that came, we have four minutes left, even though I could talk to you for hours. Um, do ESA letters expire? One person noted that her landlord asks her for the documentation every year. I am not aware of uh, official expiration. I've heard recommendations from different like animal accommodation law folk. I would be interested in, in, in you know, Carol, your that's, uh, um, you know, clinically people's needs can change. So if the person is, you know, a, a let's say a mental health therapist, um, I've heard some practices say, well, we, we require, you know, we say people have to get, you know, their letters updated every six months, but that is clinical. That is, okay, I'm a treatment provider. I don't feel comfortable writing the letter as your treatment provider unless we talk about it every six months. That's not legal. That, there's nothing in the Fair Housing Act that says that I would have to do that. That's me being, a you know, if I, if I was to do that, that would be me being a, a therapist that's cautious. Um, so I guess that's the long way of saying, not that I'm aware of. But uh, one year is often what, what is put out there, but I, I don't know of a legal like expiration date, but I will, I will ask. <laughs> I am working on a case with the Department of Justice, so uh, I, I will see what I can find out for us. And I will get back to Carol and we can get that. Um, one board. question I have, and this is just, you know, obviously I've learned so much between my conversation with Tim in the previous session and with you. Um, one way that landlords or housing providers want to get around is say, sort of saying breed restrictions. So yeah. under like FHA, if they have any, if they have an ESA letter and they have an ESA animal and that happens to be a pit bull, can they say, well, you can't have that. I don't care if you have an ESA letter, you can't have that pit bull in this apartment. Let me pull that up. Because I, I that that memo I that mentioned. That happens a lot. I, I I'm in uh, Jersey City. Oh, I'm which sure is like, it does. Right breed discrimination York, is. Um, yeah, and I just believe breed restrictions are inherently racist. Um, oh, they are. And I am a person with Chihuahuas. Well, only one now. Um, and Chihuahuas are more vicious than pit bulls. So oh, that's they have my much home. more bite histories, right? Yeah, yeah. it's very problematic. Um, Okay, this is the actual memo I'm sharing. Do you all see it in full screen? Yes. The whole thing? Okay. So As a I'm... best practice, disability related information. Here we go. This is the HUD memo. Again, it's available. Um, and folks, um, I put um, the link to the HUD memo in the chat. So we'll make sure that um, we get Janet's slides and um, maybe even a PDF of the memo and put it in the um, app. Here we go. So this is page 14 from HUD, so specific animal conduct, if it's a direct threat or fundamental alteration, but they cannot arbitrarily limit the breed or size of the dog. And that includes, nice. they do not, pet rules do not apply to service animals or support animals. Um, awesome. Another common question <laughs> is, can they have, and it's, like I said, it's right there. So um, actually, you know, uh, non-domesticated animals, um, have case by case and, basis. I, I'm asked about have. that. What I, and there is information about what they call unique animals. Um, like there was a case of a guy that uh, he had an emotional support chicken and there was a challenge and, um, you know, my, my concern is, oh, I always want to, you know, I'm concerned for the animals, you know, well-being and the animal being able to meet their species specific needs, although I'm not an animal, you know, again, behaviorist or professional, but in terms of being able to bond and have benefits from the bond, um, 
you know, the, the chicken, um, you know, chickens can know their names, they're affectionate, they're social, like all that. They have care needs. People can be motivated to take better care of themselves. To, you know, all of the things that could happen with other animals we're bonded to were happening with him and his chicken. Um, you know, people, one time there was an emotional support squirrel uh, scenario. When I, whenever there's like news things like that, I will get a lot of emails. Like, what do you think, Janet? Should there be emotional support squirrels? Like, can a squirrel be supportive? And my response to that is like twofold. Like, can there be? Absolutely. They're social mammals. They're affection. Should there be? Like, squirrels don't need people. Like they can do squirrel things out in the world. I mean, I know there's always the isolated incident, no wildlife rehab. There's this like, one guy on TikTok that, and I know we're over time as we're talking about squirrels in TikTok, uh, that has a squirrel that like they're bonded and he like, yeah, they're friends and their family. Um, so yeah. Well, Janet, thank you so much. This has been yeah. amazing. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. Um, and, uh, you know, the chat's still going on. We're going to have a 15 minute break now. So, well, 13 minutes now. Um, but I really just want to thank Janet for giving us her time and her expertise. And I really do think that we're all now really equipped with understanding the Fair Housing Act and how we can advocate for um, ourselves and for um, the people that we serve. So, Janet, really, thank you, thank you, thank you, um, you everyone. Um, very welcome. Can I just say um, one at, more? Yep. One more super quick. This is another, people want to know, can you have more than one emotional support animal for a person? On that memo, you can. However, you need to specify how the animals help with different things. So if one animal is helping calm the person's panic attacks and the other animal is getting the person out of the house, um, it needs to, you need to be clear, like what, why to, that's all. Thank you, Carol. I just want to make sure no Thank free you. restrictions and you can have more than one. Thank you, Janet. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Take care.